Welcome to the fourth Asia Global Institute's Public Policy Webinar. I'm Hei Wai Tang, Associate Director of the Institute. The AGI Public Policy Webinar invites leading academics and scholars from universities and think tanks around the world to present current research on global public policy issues and discuss their implications for Asia and the world. The speaker of our webinar today is Professor David Lambton, Senior Fellow at the Science Foreign Public Policy Institute and Professor Emeritus at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Immediately prior to his current post, he was Oxenberg Rowland Fellow at Stanford University's Asia Pacific Research Center from 2019 to 2020. For more than two decades prior to that, he was Heeman Professor and Director of China Studies at the Johns Hopkins University Science. He's also former chairman of the Asia Foundation, former president of the National Committee on United States-China Relations, and former dean of faculty at Science. In the first half of today's webinar, Professor Lambton will first talk about his new book titled Rivers of Iron, Railroads and Chinese Power in Southeast Asia. The book is about China's effort to create an inter-country railway system connecting China with its seven Southeast Asian neighbors. He will highlight the political strengths and weaknesses of the plan and evaluate the abilities of impacted countries to respond to China's Belt and Road Initiative. During the webinar, please feel free to type questions in the Q&A box. I will try my very best to direct your questions during the Q&A session after Professor Lambton's presentation. Professor Lambton, please take away. Well, uh, thank you, Professor Tong, and thank all of you, those of you in Asia, for being with us uh, this evening. And uh, I'm in the uh, east, eastern time zone of the United States, so it's uh, late at night for me. But uh, wherever you are, I'm, I'm glad to be able to interact with you, and I hope we'll have plenty of uh, time for uh, some interaction. Uh, I also want to thank Joyce Yen and the uh, Institute for uh, sponsoring this and her for all her hard work in uh, setting up the, uh, the program. I also, given that I'm the one doing the talking, I want to fully acknowledge that our, our book, uh, Rivers of Iron, that uh, Professor Tong just mentioned, is a, a three co-author book and it's genuinely three equal co-authors. And though I'm doing the talk talking this evening, uh, I think it's an interesting example of truly cross-national uh, comparative uh, analysis and cross-national research team. And um, given that the book covers uh, seven Southeast Asian countries on the, so on the continent plus Singapore, and also Indonesia in some considerable measure, and then China. Altogether, we have around nine countries that we have uh, are, are dealing with. So it was basically, I would say, impossible for uh, a specialist of one or two countries to do a justice to such a complicated international, indeed globalized project. So I just want to emphasize that uh, we were three co-equal authors and each brought strengths to this. Also, the, so I'll mention the research strategy involved needing access to, as it works out, nine countries. And obviously we all had somewhat different and complementary Rolodexes. So research-wise, I think this is an interesting example of cross-national uh, research, comparative research with a, a cross-national uh, research uh, team. I also, because the project involves so many countries and such uh, many of which are quite large countries and a vast amount of real estate, uh, an important uh, part of the project uh, was funding. And I want to thank our funders because uh, all the travel and analysis and the five years it took us to write the book required a lot of funding. And the Smith Richardson Foundation in the United States, uh, Stanford, and SICE itself helped fund this. So I certainly want to thank all our uh, funders. Finally, the book was put out in October of last year. 
uh, by the University of California Press, and it's in their Lilienthal series. So I'm proud of the book, and in as much as I think it's nicely produced, it's affordable, and the University of California Press, I think, did a very good job both in editing and turning out a volume that would be pleasing to read and also affordable. So with all those thank yous, uh, let me get on uh, with the subject. And uh, I suppose the first thing we, we need to say about all of this is sort of what was the, the framework that was implicit, that motivated us to undertake this project. When you do a project that takes five years and involves so much travel and interaction, you, you have a purpose. And I think as our book unfolded, there became progressively more talk about decoupling, the United States decoupling its economy uh, from China, others uh, hedging their economic bets, diversifying supply chains. And I think a certain amount of this will happen in the future. But we did dedicate our book to the proposition that building connections is the future and building walls is the past. So I think while you might say globalization between the pandemic and uh, uh, declining economic and political relations between China and uh, much of the West uh, is the story of the day over the long haul, uh, I think we believe at least that connections and who dominates networks not only a cyber networks, but maritime networks, railroads, highways, whoever is at the hub of those is in the long run going to be relatively successful. So while uh, connectivity may have its uh, problems, uh, a lot of talk of decoupling, we're dedicated to the proposition that uh, connectivity is still the long-term trend and will be important in determining who's powerful or more powerful and who's less powerful. Now, this book has many dimensions. And one of the things I'm proud of is that it, it looks at this development of rail connectivity, not only from China's viewpoint, but also from the viewpoint of all the involved partner countries uh, in Southeast Asia. So I think it's a very balanced book, not just about China, and it's not built on the presumption that China simply acts and Southeast Asia reacts or tries to defend itself as best it can. In many respects, the Southeast Asian countries have agency. And so I'm proud of the book in as much as I think it's balanced regionally and and all uh, giving agency and capacity to act and protect their own val uh, values and interests, uh, Southeast Asians are not powerless in this uh, equation. Um, also, I think that we have a image of, of China as a kind of a Goliath, a Leviathan, bestriding the world, sort of crushing uh, in all its wake. Uh, its, uh, its competitors, others bending to its will. And uh, I think the reality is much more interactive than that kind of model of domination uh, would suggest. Uh, now this map is just a stylized, it's, it's basically accurate, but you need to realize what's on this map. The, our study is unique in as we're looking at an evolving vision of rail connectivity. The lines that are the dotted lines that are radiate out from Kunming, both into China itself and then uh, southward uh, in the west uh, to Burma, Myanmar, uh, southward through Laos and Thailand, uh, eastward uh, through Vietnam, Cambodia. All of them, turn, those lines terminating in Bangkok and then going to a common line from Bangkok down to Singapore. The first thing to realize is this uh, is a vision. This is a vision of high, uh, high speed and a moderate speed rail construction that uh, China has. There are other rail lines, fragments of uh, rail lines with different kinds of specifications. Uh, 
this set of rail, uh, contemplated uh, rails is what's called 1.435 meters, which means there's 1.435 meters between the two rails. In earlier waves of rail construction in Southeast Asia, the, the rails were one meter apart. So this is a much bigger, capable of hauling much more weight, higher speeds. But this map here is only showing the new contemplated system, not all of the pre-existent uh, rails with different specifications. Now, just to be a little more specific about the vision, if you start at the top of the map and look at Kunming, you'll see off to your left uh, to the west is a line that radiates due west and then cuts south through Mandalay uh, down to Yangon and then down to uh, Bangkok. That's uh, called the western route. Virtually none of that has been built given all the problems uh, Myanmar has, uh, political instability, um, uh, some insurrectionist activity in the uh, north, uh, part of Myanmar, uh, given all of the things you're reading about in uh, the newspapers. Uh, that, that's a line that will, if it is built, be in the future for the most part. In uh, any case, that terminates at Bangkok. Now, if you go back to Kunming and go due south, you'll see a line what we refer to as the central line. And that goes from Kunming down to Vientiane, the capital of Laos on the Mekong River, and then heads south and uh, uh, gets to Bangkok eventually. This line is the most advanced under construction in substantial measure, Al uh, already goes from Kunming into Laos, uh, at, at least the construction, and also will, uh, by December of this year, the rail line probably should reach uh, Vientiane. So by the end of this year, the central line will be from Kunming to Vientiane. Uh, at the same time, China is negotiating with the Thai uh, authorities to push the rest of the line through Thailand. And quite a bit of progress has been made on the negotiations. A preliminary uh, work has been done, I'll describe later, uh, but still, uh, the Thailand portion is, except for 3.5 kilometers, not yet under construction, although the negotiations are quite advanced and um, preliminary work has begun. Then if you go back to Kunming and go to Hanoi and then down to Ho Chi Minh City and then through Phnom Penh to Bangkok, that's what we'll refer to as the Eastern Line. Uh, there are some pre-existent line that the French built from Haiphong and Hanoi up to China, but vir virtually nothing has been built there. The Vietnamese are nervous and uh, it's gonna take a long time for I think a project to materialize there. So what we're talking about is a very big um, multi-decade vision. Uh, the central line is quite advanced at least to Bangkok. But you'll note that I've not said anything about what's below Bangkok all the way down to Singapore. That's a complex story. Uh, but a piece of this high speed or higher speed uh, rail is being built on the dotted line in uh, uh, eastern Malaysia. Uh, and uh, th there was a, a plan uh, not too long ago that Singapore uh, and Malaysia would cooperate to build to Kuala Lumpur but that's been cast in uh, to limbo uh, because of the election of May uh, uh, 2018 that led to a change in government and projects postponed. So the point is that this whole map is uh, a, a vision. Much of it hasn't really begun construction, not clear when some Concern, but some construction down the central alley to Bangkok has become. So uh, this is a, a, a kind of project research project that's different than many implementation studies. Most implementation studies look at a completed project and say, where did it come? Uh, how did it get approved? What were the problems in building it? And how effective is the resulting system? 
obviously this is it, this project's inspired by those questions, but there's that overriding fact that only part of the system is under construction. And as every part is built, that and then influences the character of the remaining sections that will be built. So it's a very big project. And uh, Indonesia fits into the story because it awarded the Chinese a high-speed rail uh, contract uh, uh, a, number, a couple of years back. And uh, that's that those negotiations and the problems faced have influenced the negotiations on the projects that are on the map that you can see. So that brings me to the uh, sort of next uh, uh, qu question. And that is um, what, uh, what are the, the, the central questions uh, that this, this project raises? I should say uh, just a couple more things uh, on the map while we have it. Up uh, in Kunming, you'll note there are arrows going into China itself. And certainly from the Southeast Asians viewpoint, one of the big attractions is this opens up China's 30,000 kilometers of high speed rail and many more tens of thousands of kilometers of uh, conventional rail to exports from Southeast Asia. So it's not just a question of integrating uh, Southeast Asian uh, value chains and flows into China, uh, into Southeast Asia from China, but from the, China, uh, the Southeast Asian viewpoint, it's offering access to a very extensive Chinese system. And then as China hooks to Central Asia on onto Europe, uh, this uh, Southeast Asian system would get the benefit of that, presumably. So both the Southeast Asians and the Chinese have very great interests in this. I just say one other thing is if you look at the map, all three of these lines are go to Bangkok. And Bangkok, in, in, the Thais, uh, have a very great interest in becoming sort of the transportation hub for Southeast Asia. So at the same time, China has its objectives vis-a-vis -vis Southeast Asia. Of course, the Thais have their objective to make themselves into a hub for their very big and fast growing region. Bangkok sort of views itself as a potential Chicago, if you're drawing an analogy to America, where you had a big port in the case of Chicago, the Great Lakes, you had Northwest or Northeast uh, east, west, north, south uh, transportation in Chicago. Bangkok sees itself playing the same kind of nodal uh, role uh, for Southeast Asia. So the Thais have very big interests uh, in this as well. Now, um, let me just uh, ask a few questions here. Uh, what are the basic I was, you might ask, well, where did this project come from? And what were the questions that, that animated us to begin with? And I looked at this map, it was printed in a newspaper about six years ago as just a vision. And I said to myself, well, what are gonna be the politics of this? You have China, which of course, even doing its own big infrastructure within the country has many uh, severe problems. How much more complicated politically is it gonna be for China to uh, play a major role in uh, rail integration in Southeast Asia, where you have a great variety of different cultures, uh, you have different geographic circumstances, different economic levels, uh, different histories dealing with China. You know, Vietnam's uh, history with China is certainly different than Thailand's. So very, I was very interested in answering just a very simple question. In this age of globalization, can China do it? And when you say, can China do it, that has at least two aspects. One is, can China do the engineering, complex engineering project execution across such a range of political systems? Uh, so there's sort of the technical, can it do it? But I think even more difficult was, can China politically do it? Uh, can China deal with dexterity and nuance and sophistication? 
sophistication with this range of, of countries. So certainly one of the major issues was, can China do it? A second set of issues, because China is proceeding with this and negotiating country by country, segment by segment, and as I mentioned, is now already almost got the railroad to near Vientiane in Laos, uh, what are the implementation problems China's facing? What are the difficulties that you face, both political and technical, in building such an enormous project? Uh, certainly another whole set of questions is, how will such an interconnected network, should it be completed or even substantially completed, uh, how is this going to change the geo economics of this region uh, and how will it affect the larger global geostrategic and geoeconomics of the world? Uh, if you just think back, uh, uh, each of these lines, these three lines is longer than the transcontinental railroad that was built in the United States from 19, 1863 to 1869. Uh, and we, I think, all are generally acquainted with the impact the Transcontinental Railroad had in the United States, along with the Panama Canal, and it basically turned the United States into both a united continent and a base of projecting power across the Pacific that eventually involved uh, the Philippines and U.S. naval presence of a very substantial size uh, in 20th and 21st century. Uh, Asia. So what are going to be the geopolitical consequences of knitting together this many hundreds of millions of economically dynamic people uh, with a system that's three times longer than the one that so transformed the continent of the United States? So that was certainly a major con uh, issue. And then, as I signaled before, another major question we wanted to answer is this just about China, what China wants and what China is imposing on other countries? Or is there true negotiation where each of the countries has agency? And just to signal a point that I, I would make later is I think uh, Certainly, some countries have more leverage with China than others. I would say Laos has relatively little. Uh, Thailand has a lot. Malaysia has a lot. Singapore has a lot. So uh, each of the countries is their own special case. But I would say every country has substantial resources uh, in dealing with the Chinese. Now, the, another whole area that I think might be interesting uh, and uh, hope will come up in, in questions is given this range of countries, uh, nine countries involved, uh, how does one go about the research and what's the future of this kind of uh, research? I think our research had two broad prongs. One is that we did substantial documentary research, meaning local newspapers, local reports, uh, but also multilateral organizations, whether it's the Asia Development Bank or the uh, various ASEAN uh, uh, entities and reports, um, also the Asia Investment Infrastructure Bank, World Bank, uh, all of these multilateral en entities are involved to one extent or another, uh, but they all turn out a, a documentary output. So before we did any interviewing, which was the second prong, we wanted to have thorough command of the documentary uh, base because you don't want to waste your time in interviews asking questions that you could read about in perfectly reliable documents. And also sometimes when you're looking at documents, things are unclear. And so a command of the documentary record gives you the basis to ask intelligent questions of your interviewees. And in interviews, it's been my experience, the interviewee is interviewing the interviewer at the same time the interviewer is interviewing the interviewee. That is, they are deciding how forthright to be. They're deciding what, how much you know, how much you would understand. And so the interviewer 
I think, owes it to himself and the interviewee to be as conversant with all of the written material as possible. And across nine countries, of course, that's a major uh, task. Um, the, the next thing that I, I, I would say is that we then turn to the interviews uh, and um, I've lost my picture here. Do you have the, let's see. Well, in any case, uh, I, I, I've lost the picture, but I think you can see me, can you? Hey, why? There we go, good. Uh, so in any case, we had to interview across 158 different organizations, as I said, in nine countries. Uh, and uh, that took a lot of time. Now, I think it's interesting and it, it, um, it, it's always a question, what was the role of luck in any enterprise, including a scholarly enterprise? And as it turned out, when we started five, six years ago, uh, we started our interviewing in China, uh, partly because I had the most extensive contacts there and we needed time to cultivate contacts in the Southeast Asian countries more thoroughly. Uh, so we started in China and then most of our research after the first year, year and a half was in Southeast Asia. Now, given the way things have developed in US relations with China and China's a relative openness or lack thereof to the rest of the world, had we saved China for the end of this project, I don't think we would have had the access today that we had then. But my point is, we had very good access in China, uh, very good cooperation, and I think many reasons for that. But one is that the Chinese are quite proud of this, this uh, system. So uh, in any case, uh, that's uh, sort of what I have to say about the research. I would just conclude on, on the research that I think as China becomes relatively more closed for the next period, and some people might want to challenge me about whether that's actually the direction, but it's my expectation that it'll be harder to do high quality interviewing in China in the next period of time than it was in the preceding period of time. And therefore we're all as students of China at least going to have to develop more refined and sophisticated methods to study China from the outside with relatively less access to China from the inside. I'm not, certainly not saying uh, there will be none, but I think in terms of degrees of, relatively of relative openness, uh, China in the preceding five years will look to have been more open than perhaps in the next five years. Now, this book to me was very interesting because it not only raised interest, uh, interesting questions with respect to China and the Southeast Asian countries, but it's raised some very fundamental, um, uh, I would say almost global kinds of, of issues. For instance, what is the role of infrastructure in development? We often talk about, you know, China has its view of things and its interests and its neighbors often have somewhat different views and different interests, at least in some respects. But when it comes to infrastructure and the role of infrastructure and development, uh, China and I would say all of these uh, Southeast Asian countries share, broadly speaking, one very important view. And that is that in the construction of infrastructure has to precede, be go before growth. You need to build the skeleton by which economic flows, human flows, resource flows can move along the skeleton of infrastructure. In this case, uh, railroads, but it would apply also to cyber pathways, highways, maritime roads, routes, and so forth. But China is united, I think, conceptually in the, they all believe that if you want to get rich, build a road. That, and often a Western analysis and certainly a World Bank and a, to a lesser extent, Asian Development Bank, US Agency for International Development, 
uh, for the last 20 years, they've been kind of reluctant to engage in big infrastructure and rather concentrate on building governance, rule of law, civic organizations, build society, and then foster growth through that kind of institutional change, and then eventually build infrastructure. So the Chinese are offering these leaders who want to see infrastructure first in the sequence, China has, them something, has something to offer. Uh, not only the money, but they share a concept. To make a long story short, and the book deals with this, I think the US and the West and Japan has, have always been a little further along than the United States in this thinking is moving towards getting in the infrastructure game. And if you listen carefully to what the Biden administration is saying, and uh, even the Congress, they're talking about the need to get involved in international infrastructure, as well as our obviously our crying need for domestic infrastructure. So one very interesting part of this bo book is it speaks to this issue of how do you get economic growth and development? And the fact that you know you may not agree with everything the Chinese do, but the point is its neighbors in some important ways share common vision of development, even if not in all of the details. Certainly a whole nother, I think, broad area of question has to do with industrial policy. This book deals with how China built a high-speed rail industry domestically, how it built 30,000 kilometers of high-speed rail line in about a decade, how it built an industry that could export and become a global standard competitive with the Germans, the French, the Republic of Korea, the Canadians. Uh, China built from the ground up an industry that's a global competitor. And it's more than a little interesting how China did this. And the answer is it had industrial policy. It focused research and development. It acquired legally and illegally uh, technology. Uh, and it put state finance behind this effort. Now, you might criticize this on free uh, economy, free trade grounds, and so on, and many people do. But at the end of the day, you have to ask, does it work? And I think if you look at the discussion in the United States now, there's a lot more talk about what we hesitate to call industrial policy, but the Americans are beginning to think about, do we need to be more uh, focused uh, and uh, the state playing a bigger role in creating keystone industries? So this whole question about the role into the future of industrial policy, particularly after so many decades of sort of a, more or less a fair economic views, I think is an important uh, uh, thing to talk about. Uh, also, um, I think a, a, a couple of other questions about China. What do you learn about the Chinese political system? How much control does, was, does Beijing exert over the manifestation of BRI as it moves into a set of projects like this? And I think we argue that um, Beijing develops the concept, but there's a lot of entrepreneurship in China. Provinces, state enterprises, even private enterprises play a major role in the dynamic push of the Chinese economy uh, into uh, uh, the world. So I think, hey, why I, I've probably talked enough. I don't think too much over time, but uh, I'd much rather hear the questions and try to have some dialogue. Are we on? Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Uh, this yeah. happened uh, all the time. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Lambton, uh, for the fascinating, thought-provoking uh, sharing uh, and a very quick summary of, I'm sure, a very uh, deep uh, and equally thought-provoking book. Uh, there are already quite some questions uh, in the in the Q and A room, uh, but I would like to ask the first two. Um, and uh, you know, some of our participants already uh, raised a similar question as well, and that is, how was this 
a big project uh, being funded. Uh, obviously, uh, when I asked this question to our former colleague, uh, Deborah Breitingham, uh, she referred me to you uh, because uh, she said uh, her expertise is on uh, China-Africa relationship, while uh, you have a new book about uh, this uh, particular Belt and Road Initiative project in Southeast Asia. Um, and as we all know, uh, there has been uh, quite a lot of discussion, uh, especially in the West, uh, about the so-called debt trap diplomacy, uh, making some of these countries more financially dependent on China. Uh, could you speak a little bit about, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, all these different projects are being funded and, you know, how involved uh, is China financially in these projects? Well, uh, we have to start out with truth in advertising <laughs> and the truth is of course China and the partner countries aren't always very transparent. So we have to start out by saying there are probably important things that we don't know about each of these cases. So this is an area where we need to know more. But I think there is a general picture. And I think the United States, particularly under the last administration, but frankly, it appears to me the current Biden administration has a, a similar uh, evaluation. And that's, as you mentioned, it's sort of debt trap diplomacy is the one sentence description that many Westerners and particularly American analysts are looking at. And I think that is, um, there are of course cases where that might look to have been the outcome. I'm not sure that was the strategy or, uh, the uh, intention. But my major point is that each of these projects, as I said, this project is unfolding sequentially. They negotiate with Laos, then they negotiate with uh, Thailand, they negotiate with Singapore and Malaysia. So each of these uh, negotiations affects the other uh, and it occurs sequentially. So what I'm saying is there's no single cookie cutter formula for finance. Every project is sui generis, uh, uh, con the, the finance constructed. Let me just give you several examples of what I mean. I said Indonesia wasn't originally part of our uh, consideration, but they negotiated the first deal in the region. So they became the template. China wanted the first project that was up against the Japanese in Indonesia and wanted to beat the Japanese no matter what. And therefore they drove a, a very uh, favorable deal with uh, Indonesia, gave Indonesia a very low interest rate. Uh, and uh, so that, that they got the deal, Japan did not. Japan, by the way, won one in India where it was up against China as the competitor. But then China began to negotiate with Thailand and Thailand says, we, 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 uh, we want a better interest rate than you gave to Indonesia. And China thought it had given a terrific rate to Indonesia and wasn't gonna give more of a favorable rate. And finally, Thailand said, okay, we will fund it ourselves or we will fund it through non-Chinese mechanisms. And that's what I mean. Not all of these countries have the same leverage. Thailand already had a railroad right away, so didn't have to acquire so much land and so forth. In the case of Laos, all of it's a poor country, has very slim foreign exchange reserves. There aren't many people and there's lots of mileage going through 60 to 70 percent of the line is through tunnels and bridges. So very expensive to build, very small population, very poor, no cash. So there I would say debt trap fits the description a little uh, more. But remember, you're talking about, in a sense, nailing tracks to the ground and building a system in Indonesia, I mean, or in these countries. And they can't, if they get expropriated or the, the project uh, you know, the, the, the borrowing country can't pay off, the railroad's still there. So China's taking some risks, but let's put it this way. It looks most like debt trap with Laos, probably least so, and also Singapore. Singapore can pay for this thing in a number of ways. 
Uh, Malaysia also has a lot of payment options, although in this case, uh, the Chinese charged the Indonesians so much. When Mahathir came back into office in May of 2018, he renegotiated the deal and the Chinese had to undo the previous deal and make a much more favorable one. So what I'm trying to say is, I think it's Washington rhetoric, quite frankly, to say it's all a big debt trap and let it go there. Uh, the Chinese have risks. The, the, the one project that has most resembled and been talked about about debt trap is the, uh, the Hanban Toda port in Sri Lanka, where China had to, in effect, take a 99-year lease and run the port because they weren't getting paid back by the Sri Lankan government. But there are many Chinese that aren't very happy with some of these uh, sweetheart deals either. There are many Chinese in China saying, why are we building uh, white elephant vanity projects in various countries when we have a lot of domestic needs? So I think this notion of just debt trap diplomacy ignores the variety of projects, the variety of deals, and the fact that many Chinese aren't happy uh, with this allocation of resource that's uh, uh, in any case, does that uh, speak to some of the questions, Hey, why? Yes, thank you for the very elaborative uh, response uh, to this question, which I'm sure the participants are very happy to hear. Um, my second question is uh, the focus, uh, as we have uh, discussed, uh, have been on you know, the infrastructure development and you know, the finance implication, financial implications of things. But how about technology transfer? or more broadly speaking, as you have mentioned, uh, industrial policy that has been very well practiced in China uh, would, through th this kind of projects uh, and your analysis, uh, uh, do you see China is sort of exporting this sort of governance model in particular, you know, more emphasis on industrial policy and public private partnership, which may have been influencing this region in changing the business model closer to uh, the Chinese model and a little bit away from sort of the new liberal uh, kind of um, economic planning uh, and, and governance? Well, I think there seem uh, a couple of questions buried within that one bigger question. Let me address technology transfer. Um, of course, there are a wide range of, of uh, countries in terms of technological capacity. Uh, and uh, and as countries get more developed in negotiating with China, they want to have a plan for um, a, a, a technological transfer from China to them. They also negotiate hard with the Chinese to have things that can be supplied in that country for the project built and manufactured there. For example, if Malaysia is negotiating a, the a rail line, a, one of the rail lines with China, it negotiates to make the rolling stock. It's at a, an appropriate technological level to make the cars, although it might not be able to make the switching systems or the propulsion engines and so forth. So each of these countries has technological capabilities and technological needs. And the more developed the country, the more they negotiate with the Chinese to get technological transfer. Also, in the case of the ties, the Chinese kept saying, well, your workers aren't adequately trained. We've got to supply Chinese. But then the Chinese say, OK, or the ties say, train some of our workers. And there's a whole set of agreements that pertain to training of workers either in Thailand or uh, in China or some combination thereof. So I would say that what, what the technology, technology transfer issues are depends on the uh, country. It may be by the time we get 20 or 30 years down the building this vision, it could be that the Chinese build the tracks, but maybe for Singapore, Singapore and Malaysia decide to buy Chinese engines or a Japanese engines or so on. So th that consortia of countries companies might form. And so while the, the this, this vision starts out with China playing a major role, 
it might be as over time other countries become more competitive involved they get subcontracts in all of this so i would say just in the same way of financing is tailored technology transfer training indigenization of subsystems to be produced in those countries all of that's up for negotiation now once again laos is going to be in the worst position Burma is going to be in a pretty bad position. Vietnam is sort of in the middle. But when you start getting to Singapore and then Thailand and Malaysia, uh, you've got countries with uh, options. Does that address the question? Yes, thank you. Um, and I think Professor Chen uh, wants uh, to ask a few questions too. OK, thank you. Thank, you. Uh, thank you, David, for the uh, wonderful uh, presentation. I just have a very uh, a quick comment on the question. Uh, that is, uh, you know, as you, your wonderful map has shown, uh, actually much of the rail line is along the coastal line in uh, Thailand and then Vietnam and then Cambodia. Right. First, uh, what is commercially, uh, you know, valuable uh, is already done by the sea routes because for goods transportation and people transportation, you know, they can either rely on the existing sea routes or air routes. Uh, so right. I don't know how much more real additional commercial or economic development value such rail lines can really add, uh, especially for the uh, countries in Southeast Asia. I understand from the um, uh, perspective of China, maybe uh, a key strategic uh, attraction is that by uh, doing a lot of the projects in Thailand, that can help uh, bring Thailand more into uh, China's uh, hands so that, uh, you know, maybe uh, a canal can be constructed to cut across, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Pendle, uh, the, the um, Prey Canal. A little, yeah. Uh, for, for more, uh, you know, uh, openings uh, you know, between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, because right, right now the Strait of uh, Malacca is the only uh, route uh, all the um, cargo ships can go through, but if there can be another canal uh, constructed uh, to bring, uh, to connect the two oceans, uh, that would just make the cargo ships uh, for, from China and to China uh, have more options. Um, but of course, uh, right now, Thailand may not be too crazy or too interested in doing that. Uh, maybe the, all the rail lines uh, that may not be that useful uh, can actually help um, make the um, persuasion easier to do. Uh, so from your perspective, you know, what are the real additional values all the rail, uh, expensive rail lines can actually really provide? Well, you've, you've hit, uh at least three major set of questions here. But let me, and I'll, they're all very good, and I don't think there are any absolutely correct answers. But uh, let me say that the, the starting at the end there, uh, what is the value added of additional rail lines that are admittedly very expensive? Uh, and I think this gets to uh, what you might call cost benefit analysis. And it gets to what you think the benefits are. Uh, the benefits can be, and of course, a, a strict kind of Western accounting would say, well, what is going to be the passenger revenue? What's going to be the revenue from freight? Uh, what are going to be the development revenues you can from development along the lines? And you come up with a number. Uh, but of course, uh, you have the other side of that's the revenue, but what are the or what are the gains, cost, benefit, and of course, well maybe you don't have to build so many highways, maybe you don't end up with so many cars on the roads and all the problems that represents. Um, maybe we are going to resolve some of the uh, regional inequalities in uh, bring access to Laos bring access to the northern part of Thailand, to the world economy, and so on. So spark sort of what you might call more 
intra-country uh, equality, put it that way. So all I'm saying is you can make a case for almost any project, depending on what you presume the revenues are going to be and what you think the costs are going to be. And it's essentially over that question that so much politics resolve or revolves. Because a lot of, you know, if you go to any one of these countries, they've got a railroad bureaucracy. And surprisingly enough, railroad bureaucracies want to build railroads. But if you go to the highway bureaucracy, they want to build highways. You go to the air transport people, they want to build airplanes. So everybody's got an idea of relative cost benefit that makes the case they want to make. So in the end, it's there is a political dimension uh, to, to all of that. The Another thing that your very good questions, it seems to me, raise is though, you mentioned the the most developed area down along the the the, the, the coast in Thailand, that east west uh, corridor, and and going from uh, Ho Chi Minh City through Nam Pan through southern Thailand or at least central Thailand along the coast, on to Burma and India, and there's a large part of the or a significant part of the book where we talked about. And this is what's wrong with the US. We framed it as do we oppose BRI or don't we? What I we argue for is we need a concept of balanced connectivity in Southeast Asia. So at the same time, China, quite frankly, is trying to build north-south connectivity. I think China has an objective of making itself the hub of the Asian economy in a very, as I sort of described Chicago. China, the Chicago of Asia, so to speak. Well, but the Indians want to play a role. The Thais want to play a role, the Vietnamese. And so there's a whole, I think, um, and the Japanese have pursue, uh, pursued this line of thinking, east-west connectivity. So the US could get involved in real rail development in, in uh, India, across southern Thailand, into Vietnam, if we were our companies or consortia or our aid agencies were interested. So uh, part of our, our, our premise in the book is the US should be more than Mr. No here. You know, you know, what we're opposed to. The issue is what are we for? And there are a lot of good projects that could be built that aren't on this map particularly. Uh, so I think that we ought to, uh, see infrastructure as a driving force for development, but that doesn't mean we have to sign on or for that matter, oppose everything the Chinese are doing. Does that deal with any of your questions? Yeah, I, I guess just, I just want to quickly add, I mean, there's kind of a consensus among economic historians uh, that the, uh, the US railroad system built in the 19th century was uh, for the most part uh, a waste of uh, resources. So, <laughs> but I guess uh, uh, where well, that applied to uh, Southeast Asia, given that, uh, you know, the geography is not that easy and, uh, and also the population density, it's not extremely high. Uh, and and the, the, the sea routes that used to be what uh, we would call the Maritime Silk Road already connect, uh, you know, have connected uh, all these countries for you know the last uh, what uh, millennium or longer, uh, so the additional value added I, I, is something I uh, have a lot of doubt about. Yeah, yeah, I can see you have lots of doubts. Let me just tell you where I'm coming from. That doesn't mean it's right. It just means where I'm coming from. Yeah. I uh, grew up in California. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the robber barons and corruption that built the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, in our development, I think something around 9% of the surface area of the United States was literally given to the railroads for construction, all the railroads, not just the Transcontinental. But I, as, as uh, uh, Hei Wai Tong just mentioned, I have spent not, uh, the last year out at Stanford. Now here, just one, one, pay, one spin off of the railroad was creating the fortune of Leland Stanford. 
built one of the high tech centers in the world that transformed the world economy came out of that revenue of that railroad. So that's what I mean. What do you, where do the boundaries of cost and benefit, the, the, the gold rush and the acquisition of mineral wealth by the United States, it also allowed us connect and push into the Pacific. Now, probably the people in the Philippines have mixed views about the US as a Pacific power at one point. But the point is, I'm saying a lot of this has very big impacts across uh, almost unimaginable areas. So I guess I'm sort of one of the, when, uh, the other thing to say is that uh, there was a, a, a book entitled, uh, I forget the exact title, but the, um, the uh, most wonderful project in the world is the history of the uh, Transcontinental Railroad by Ambrose. And he ends up the book by saying, in the first 10 years, a lot of people had the same questions you had. And indeed, building the Transcontinental set off one of the biggest corruption scandals the US ever had. But he said, within 10 years, nobody was arguing anything, but this was the best investment the US ever made. Uh, so I guess I'm just saying there's a kind of American narrative to the Transcontinental Railroad that uh, let's say there's more than one story there. Uh, so we have a couple of minutes left. Um, there's still a lot of questions that uh, I couldn't manage to direct them to you, but I, I think you know in in the last half an hour uh, in our interactions, you already. Uh, gave uh, quite a lot of uh, indirect answers to them. But there's one particular one which is related to your last remark about uh, the infrastructure project in the US. And that is um, in your book, uh, as well as in your talk, you emphasized heterogeneity across these seven countries in Southeast Asia. As we know, some of them have a weaker government or perhaps more corrupt government. Uh, one of the questions uh, asked about how sustainable uh, this kind of cooperation is, in particular in states where uh, corruption is more prevalent, the government is weaker, and perhaps you know it would actually empower some of the uh, uh, you know authoritarian regimes in the region. Well, uh, the the corruption um, has become not all these projects are equally advanced. So corruption isn't equally apparent, even if it may be there in the early stages, because we're in very preliminary stage. But I can say that corruption became a major, major issue in, uh, in, in Malaysia. And uh, in fact, we interviewed with form, well, he was then former Prime Minister Mahathir, who in the, uh, 1999, 2000, tried to get the Chinese involved in rail development in Malaysia, but the Chinese weren't ready to do so. Uh, anyway, Mahathir then got re-elected in the election of May, 2018. And he was so unhappy with the degree of corruption of his predecessor, uh, Najib, uh, Najib, uh, and in fact, there was a big scandal of a 1MDB uh, financial institution where uh, sweetheart contracts were being sold and residual money was going into Najib's personal foreign bank account. In fact, the US even sanctioned uh, that, uh, that uh, the, the Indonesian uh, uh, the Najib and the 1MDB bank uh, substantially. Uh, and so Mahathir got elected on anti-corruption in a sense in Malaysia, and the railroad was an important part of this. And what Najib did is base, or I mean, uh, uh, Mahathir did is stop the projects that were underway. One of them, the East Coast Rail Link was already being constructed, tunnels being dug and so forth, and stopped it in its tracks and also uh, uh, wanted to renegotiate all of many of the Chinese projects. On the railroad, he renegotiated uh, and the Chinese shortened the line 
uh, made it go through uh, politically more useful areas for Mahatir and uh, reduced the cost. I don't, don't hold me to the number, but I think somewhere around 20 to 30%. It was a substantial reduction in the cost. So I think, yes, and this, you would then ask, well, from whence comes the corruption? And that, that gets to the entrepreneurial character of state enterprises in China and provinces. Those provinces along the, the border, Guangxi, uh, Guizhou, uh, even Guangdong, certainly Sichuan's not on the border, but near, all of those uh, bordering Southeast Asia are very entrepreneurial provinces that want access to Southeast Asia. And the Southeast Asians want access to them, incidentally. Uh, and so that entrepreneurship, sometimes get, you get multiple companies from different provinces or central and provincial uh, companies uh, competing with each other. And they will spare no effort to win a contract. Uh, the Vietnamese had a very unhappy experience where a cutthroat Chinese company won the bid who never bit, built a railroad outside of China in its history. And that was an unhappy experience. So I think the Chinese are in a learning mode, uh, corruption and excessive cutthroat competition, a problem, and then plain vanilla uh, uh, corruption. And I'm sure we'll see that as it unfolds uh, across these sequential negotiations. Thank you, Mike. My last question to you, very simple. How likely do you think all these projects will be finished in the next few years, especially after the pandemic? Well, uh, as I, I said, I, I, the central line I have the most confidence about, and I would say I'm 95% confident it'll reach Bangkok before the end of the decade. In my heart, I think it'll probably be faster than that. But we'll get to Bangkok down the central line, I think, with a high degree of certainty before the end of the decade. Uh, now, you still got a lot of Thailand and Malaysia before you get to Singapore. And uh, when you're south of Bangkok, I think that's much more iffy because, first of all, you have some. Uh, insurrectionist activity in Southern Thailand, among other things. And even Singapore is worried about the security aspect of that. So uh, I also, I think you might get a link between Kuala Lumpur and Singapore in a fairly decade long time frame. Uh, then, then you say, what's likely to be next? Uh, I don't know if it will be Myanmar in that direction or Vietnam. I guess if I had to take a guess, I'd probably say Myanmar, but I, that's just a real guess. I have no certainty as to whether Vietnam would go before. All I can say is the resistance the Vietnamese demonstrate to that degree of Chinese penetration is a pretty high degree of resistance. Myanmar goes up and down. The military there is not fully trustful of China, but I just, it, maybe it'll be more feasible going through Myanmar because there are things along the way in Myanmar that uh, ports and uh, uh, petroleum and a, a number of things that might push in that direction. But I, I don't expect to live to see this whole vision, uh, that whole map realized. I think if we do look at it 30 or 40 years from now though, we will be very surprised the amount of that system or a system that looks remarkably like that. So I think that's the direction of the future, but whether it'll all be Chinese technology, whether it'll go to somewhat different places, I think all that will be negotiated. But I would just end with the thought, even if all they get in the next 10 years is a lot of that central line to Bangkok, that's going to be a very important project. Totally agree with you. Thank you so much, Professor Lambton. Uh, it's 10 o'clock uh, at night uh, in Washington, D.C., um, and I know, uh, you know you're ready for your whiskey, uh, and this is really uh, late for you, and I uh, feel very thankful uh, for you to 
share uh, so much, um, you know, your deep insights based on your analysis and obviously based on your decades of research on China and in Asia. Uh, there's still a lot of questions in the Q&A room. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time, uh, but I will uh, send all the questions to you, Professor Lampton, and uh, you will get a sense about uh, what they're excited about and what they're curious about. And I think you already answered uh, most of them uh, in uh, our interactions. All right. Uh, well, thank you. And thank all of you for, and uh, thank you for the good questions, and Professor Chun. Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay, uh, a little bit of advertisement for the next event, uh, Professor Lampton, if uh, you don't mind. Our next uh, public policy webinar is going to be given by actually my PhD advisor, Professor Paul Anchers from Harvard University. He's going to talk about the future of global value chains in the post COVID-19 economy. Next, please. And obviously, please follow us on the social media platforms. Uh, we have a weekly uh, Asia Global Online uh, article uh, published uh, by the Institute on uh, public policy, global issues on uh, Asia and the world. Uh, and obviously, we're on Facebook, YouTube, and later on, we're going to post uh, today's event on, on YouTube uh, for those of you who want to uh, uh, enjoy uh, our conversations again. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lampton. Uh, good to see you online, and I look forward to the day when we can actually talk again uh, in person. Thank you. I look forward to. Have a good, good night. night. Yeah, thank good you. night. Thank you.